buy all the books. Um, and Jessica, who is down there, so should wave, wave higher, Jessica. Yay! Okay, let's get to the books. Uh, the first book we'll be talking about today is Q to Q, Queer Canadian Theatre Performance, and Q to Q, uh, Queer Canadian Performance Text. Both are edited by Peter Dickinson, Chris Gachalian, Kathleen Oliver, and Dalbir Singh. Unfortunately, none of the editors could be here today, so we've asked Roberta Barker, who is the general editor of the new Canadian, or sorry, new essays on Canadian theatre series, uh, to come up and speak, as well as Art Babiance, uh, one of the contributors, and they're gonna come up and introduce these books to you. So Roberta is an associate professor of theater at Dalhousie University and the University of King's College. She's the author of Early Modern Tragedy, Gender and Performance, uh, 1984 to 2000, The Destined Livery. Her work on early modern and modern drama in performance has been published in Early Theater, Modern Drama, Shakespeare Quarterly, and Shakespeare Survey, among other journals and essay collections. While her articles on contemporary Atlantic Canadian theater have appeared in Canadian Theater Review and Theater in Atlantic Canada. I think I think that sentence had the words Canada and theater in it in like more than anything I've ever read. Uh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Art is a Toronto-based theater artist, educator, and researcher. His research looks at the phenomenology of multilingual acting and spectating, as well as the concept of multilingual dramaturgy. Art co-edited Theater and Learning, which focuses on contemporary applied theater practices in Canada and abroad, and the first issue of Theater Research in Canada fully dedicated to stage multilingual and multilinguals. As a theatre practitioner, Art has presented his work at various festivals, including the Toronto Fringe Festival, Summerworks, and Nuit Blanche. Since 1997, Art has been developing theatre projects, integrating acting and second language teaching. So please welcome Roberta and Art. Do you want to come up? Should we stand together? together? Uh, as one, um, I, I'm so very glad and grateful that Art is here today because I'm, I'm feeling like a huge fraud to be presenting this beautiful uh, volume uh, uh, edited with a tremendous amount of effort and love and dedication uh, by uh, the four wonderful editors, uh, Peter Dickinson, C. Gachalian, uh, Kathleen Oliver, and Dalbir Singh. We're very sorry that none of them could be with us today. Um, I'm going to do my lame uh, best to get you excited about this, this volume. Luckily, it's not a hard volume to get uh, excited about. As I'm sure uh, is, is well known to uh, many of you here, the series New Essays in Canadian Theatre was founded by Rick Knowles. Um, uh, to, uh, uh, to help to uh, bring forward new fields in Canadian theatre studies and also to look at un underexplored or underrepresented topics. And I think that this volume um, is doing that in a very, very stellar way, coming out of the q to q symposium held in Vancouver in July 2016. There's a number of people here who are at that symposium, a number of people who are contributors to this volume. It brings together the voices of many members of the LGBT2Q plus community, the artistic community, the scholarly community. We have 22 artists, administrators, and thinkers in this volume whose work is constantly in the process of redefining what we mean by queer performance on Turtle Island today. Um, the q to q Symposium uh, brought to, uh, together folks from across uh, this landmass and across uh, a huge spectrum of, of identifications and ways of thinking about queer identity and queer performance. Um, and it's a volume that showcases the uh, intersection of the question of queer theater and performance with other major questions that we're thinking about in uh, theater and performance studies today. Uh, it's intersections with questions of indigeneity and settler colonialism, uh, race and ethnicity, gender identity, gender embodiment, class, regionality, and also humor and pain. And I think those questions are really deep uh, in the volume. Among the contributors that you'll have a chance to uh, read from, if as I hope you will, you uh, buy this volume, um, are uh, uh, many people who are here today. Maybe you could like briefly wave as I mention your name if you feel so inspired. Uh, T. Berto, Kim Bird, Yuri Colin Chang, Cameron Crookston, Ryan Cunningham, Spy Denome Welsh, uh, Peter Dickinson, 
See, you got Charlie, and we've got some of the editors cl clumped together there uh, by last name. Sky Gilbert, Dirk Gint, Moynan King, uh, who you'll hear from in just a minute. Uh, Stephen Lowe, who I uh, saw just a couple minutes ago. Um, Sean Metzger, John O'Hara, or Jean O'Hara, Kathleen Oliver, Evelyn Perry, Cordula Quint, Dalber Singh, Sarah Garten Stanley, who we're going to have the opportunity to honor uh, later in this uh, in this conference, Jay Whitehead, Richie Wilcox, and Lane Zisman Newman, who I think is also here. Um, I don't know if we've seen her. Um, so it's a really exciting group of contributors. And uh, to quote the words of Sarah Garten Stanley, the contributor, one of the key contributors, uh, it reflects a moment when, what for, she says, what felt like the first time in Canadian history, queer performing artists from across the land were gathering to attempt to take one another seriously. And she says that, that is a tough job. And it's not, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a funny volume. It's also a volume that explores really difficult issues and whose contributors don't let anyone off lightly, including themselves, and certainly not this, this landmass that we uh, sometimes call Canada. Um, I think that it's a must read uh, volume about a body of work that's constantly transformative and constantly transforming. Uh, I hope you will all have a chance to look at it. Many, many thanks to the editors and to the contributors. And it's now my great pleasure to hand it over to Art to talk about the accompanying play anthology. So about um, six years ago, I was at a party at Massey College. If you know Massey College, it's the last bastion of the British Empire. Uh, <laughs> at the University of Toronto. Um, maybe not the last one, I actually don't know. <laughs> but one of the biggest ones. Um, and um, there was this woman who came up to me and, and she was very nice and, and she said, um, so where are you from? And I, and I said, I'm from Toronto. Um, and she said, no, where are you really from? So I said, I'm of Armenian origin. She said, oh, Armenian, I know another Armenian. So she grabs me like this and drags me to another room, uh, to another Armenian. Um, Armenian. <laughs> and uh, so I talked to that Armenian for 10 seconds, and we couldn't find any, anything interesting about each other. So we kind of moved on to talking to other people. And so then two years ago, I received a call from Dalbir, and uh, he's like, I have this queer Armenian play, and I have this reminiscence of the scene at Massey College. I'm like, oh, okay, here we go. You're Armenian, you're queer, you can write about queer Armenian plays, right? So, um, so I, I was kind of cautious when I said, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll write an introduction to the play called Dear Armen. Um, and then he sent me the play. Oh, actually, I said, send me the play first. So he sent me the play. <laughs> Um, and as I was reading the play, I, I was quite surprised to see the level of queering happening uh, in the play on so many levels. It was um, uh, queering the Armenian identity, the queering queering, queering theater. Um, and I happen to know certain people in Yerevan, Armenia, where this play was also presented, where local artists were invited to uh, participate. Uh, with their own art. There is a uh, place in, in the play where they can present their own work. So it, it kind of, um, we're not even talking about the fourth wall. It doesn't exist in this place. So it, it's, it, it was a wonderful read and very, very enjoyable. And the best part about it that I learned about the history of, um, the hidden history or the hidden her story of Armenia because Armenia happens to be, I don't know if you're following the news, but Armenia just had a revolution about uh, a month ago. Um, and um, uh, in that country, it's a new country, it's 25 years uh, old, but it's also 3,000 years old, and it's uh, allegedly the first Christian nation on the planet. Um, uh, so being the first Christian nation on the planet, there's a lot of pa patriarchy. 
And so reading about this woman who um, changed her name to a male name in the early 20th century while living in the Russian Empire, in the Persian Empire, in the, uh, in the Ottoman Empire, and looking at, at that incredible queer uh, persona uh, was revelatory to me because those stories are not part of the uh, traditional Armenian and I would argue many other diasporic discourses. So it was a wonderful learning experience. So I encourage you to buy this book, not only because there are lots of wonderful plays and, and relatively okay introductions like mine, um, but, it, but also because you will learn a lot of history that you don't know about. Buy the book. I feel like everyone should end their speech with by the book. That's, you know. Uh, so I'd now like to introduce Morning King. Uh, she's going to come up and speak to you about queer play. Um, originally from East Farnham, Quebec, Moynan is a Toronto-based performer, director, curator, writer, and scholar. As an actor, she has over 40 professional film, theater, and TV credits to her name. She is the author of six plays, the creator of performance installations, and was the co-creator and director of Trace. She has been an artist in residence at Studio 303 in Montreal and Nakai Theatre in uh, Whitehorse. She was the co-founder and director of the Hysteria Festival, co-director of the Rhubarb Festival, and has curated many a cabaret. A PhD candidate at York University, is that still correct? Awesome. I was like, I was like, you're so close to being finished, right? Um, uh, her academic writing has been published in journals and books. She was the editor of Canadian Theatre Review issue 149, Queer Performance, Women and Trans Artists, and is currently working on N13, a hybrid verbatim play about the Toronto housing crisis. Morning, King. So I just, I'm wondering if this is like the most times you hear the word queer in the history of the Canadian Association of Theatre Research, is it? And that is thanks to Playwrights Canada Press. Like I really just have to say, like Annie and Jessica and Blake, really, like the work that you guys do, keeping us, keeping it real for us, thank you. And this super queer year especially, right? Um, so this book is called Queer Play. And uh, this is kind of a, a love project of mine uh, that was sort of a companion to my dissertation, which is this close to being <laughs> finished. I promise, Laura, Laura's <laughs> almost finished. <laughs> um, and I was writing uh, about contemporary queer performance in Canada now. Um, and so, and, and really looking at what that means, not just to do the performance, but to live that performance, to live that identity, to be these queer, feminist artists living and the and that I find for myself and for many of my colleagues that the the boundary between life and art is very porous and we cross over and so I wanted to create a book that kind of addressed that and spoke to that and um, and so I created this book that uh, I kind of modeled after a variety show or uh, or like a, a queer feminist performance festival because um, as you know from my bio that's my background and so um, there are 10 plays, and each of them is followed by what I call a talk back in print. So the idea is you, you read the play, and then rather than having an introduction, if, you've, you know, if your interest is peaked, you just go on and you stay for the talk back, right? Like you do in, in live theater. Um, and it's, uh, I'm super proud of it, as you can probably tell. It's, it, I've, it's extremely diverse, both culturally and formally. So there's, uh, you know, I think it's the first time anybody's ever tried to publish a, a queer cabaret. So there's actually a cabaret printed here in text, spoken word, uh, traditional plays, musical, um, and short, short pieces, longer pieces. Uh, across a variety of, uh, you know, like identitarian and cultural interests. Um, and then the final, inst the final part of the book is um, a round table uh, with comedians, comedians talking about gay comedy, I called it. And um, one of the things about this is, it's there's that thing of like comedy is so important to the queer feminist performance community, but it's so, that kind of comedy, that sort of stand up, you know, not comedy within the plays, but it's so hard to publish because so much of it has to do with the delivery, right? It has to do with the performance. So rather than trying to publish those works, I got those women in a room to, to discuss it. 
And so there are 10 plays, each of them followed by a talk back, and then this really, I think, really great round table at the end, um, featuring some of our superstar Canadian uh, queer women, Carolyn Taylor, Elvira Kurt, Sabrina Jalis, and Dawn Whitwell. And um, yeah, so, so, but in the plays, we've got Shaisa Latif, Natalie Claude, Alex Tigelar, uh, Nari, Debbie Young, uh, Jess Dobkin, Hope Thompson, Flair de Pena, Jean Wong, Evelyn Perry, and all those guys I just talked about. So thank you very much for listening. Buy the book. <laughs> thank you. All right. Definitely buy the book. And I also, now because I don't know how to use iPads, I've done something terrible to my notes. Okay, uh, next up is Len Falkenstein, who's here to read to us from Lack Athabasca. This play won second prize uh, in the Herman Voden National Playwriting Competition right here at Queen's University. Um, and it's how I came across the play, is I came to the readings and saw the play read and was like, oh, oh, that's really good. Um, so yeah, that's how we published it. Uh, so Len is director of drama at the University of New Brunswick in Fredericton, where he teaches theater and playwriting and directs productions for Theater UNB. He's also the artistic director of Bard in the Barracks, Fredericton's outdoor Shakespeare company, and Notable Acts, a developmental theater company that stages an annual festival of new plays by New Brunswick playwrights or dramatists. His plays, which have been staged with his company Theater Free Radical at Summer Works and Fringe Festivals and other locations of across excuse me, across Canada, includes Soft Target, Utopia, Doppelganger, and Free Please welcome Len. Uh, thanks very much, Annie, and thanks to Jessica and Blake, everybody at the press. Uh, thanks to all of you for being here. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, great to be back at back at Queens. Uh, I think that um, the circumstances under which under which the play. Uh, is here today, um, where that uh, after the after the week-long workshop for the Voden uh, Prize, um, Annie said she was interested in publishing the play, and I think I said something embarrassing, like you just made my year or something like that. So, so um, Lack Athabasca is a play that was inspired by the train derailment disaster that took place in Lac Megantic, Quebec, in 2013, that killed uh, 47 people. Um, in the play, the events of Lac Megantic have been reimagined and relocated to Lac Madawaska, a fictional town in northern New Brunswick, uh, which is incidentally not too far from where another oil train headed to the same refinery, uh, to a refinery in New Brunswick, uh, derailed and exploded in 2014, um, but there were no um, victims in that case, which is why you probably never heard about it. Um, at the time Lac Megantic happened, uh, I had been thinking of writing another play about the Athabasca River in Alberta, uh, which has its origins at the Athabasca Glacier in the Rockies and runs north to Fort McMurray before emptying into Lake Athabasca. Uh, the Athabasca was once traveled heavily by fur traders and is now used in another form of resource extraction as the water from the river is used uh, extensively by the oil sands industry has become polluted uh, downriver from the city as a result. Um, as I thought about uh, which of these two plays to write, it occurred to me that uh, although the, the oil on the train that devastated Lac Megantic was not from Canada or the oil sands, it could have been. And uh, with that realization, my two plays became one play uh, set partly in New Brunswick and partly in Alberta, in which events, storylines, and characters intersect and echo and uh, which I see as a work that is about Canada as a nation that has been built from its settlement beginnings on the extraction and exploitation of natural resources and about the price we have paid both as a nation and in terms of individual lives as a consequence. So I'm gonna read a, an excerpt from it. Uh, in the course of the play, we meet a number of the residents of Lac Madawaska uh, who tell their stories about the disaster uh, in this scene, we meet Uget, uh, an older Acadian woman. Um, advanced disclosure, uh, I'm not actually uh, an older Acadian woman. So bear with me. Uh, she's the mayor of the town and she introduces us in this section to Henry, the engineer who was driving the train uh, that was involved in the disaster. 
um, as a staging note of relevance to the scene over the course of the play, uh, a model train town and train track are gradually built piece by piece on the stage. Even today, I still don't know why Louis is coming to me with that suggestion. I don't know why he's thinking I could do something like that. But there he was, standing in the lobby of my hotel, saying, Iget, you're going to let me sign your paper for you to run to be mayor of Lac Madawaska. Me? I don't got another four years in me. Oh, ben, tu parles d'un affaire. I guess it's from all the times we're having coffee on Wednesday morning in Café Bleu, and I'm always talking about how we need to do something to make this town a better place for the young ones, to keep them here, keep them from going out west. So I said to Louis, hey, voila, we're at the ma fair chier. Because what do I know about being mayor? But then my oldest daughter, Francine, she said to me, mama, you know who's going to run to be mayor? Cecile Dubé. Because you know she would love that for everyone to call her Madame la Mairesse. Ouais, Cecile Dubé. Tabernac. So that made me think. Maybe I don't know anything about being mayor, but I am good at running my hotel. And I know everything there is to know about this town, because my family been here for five generations. And I know for sure I'm going to make a better mayor than Cecile fucking Dubé. <laughs> so I ran, and I won. That was eight years ago. Young people is still leaving, but we make some progress. Or at least we made some progress till it happened. Henry enters and starts assembling a model train track across a map of Canada that's been projected onto the floor of the stage. Thing is, railroad built this town, huh? Steam locomotive need water, so for all them train coming here from across the country, lack is perfect. Perfect place to stop, refill the tank. So train station come first, then the town get built around that. She sets down a hotel uh, building that she has been carrying. Main line from Montréal to Port and Saint-Jean. That's where that oil was going, huh? To the big refinery in Saint-Jean, Nouveau-Brunswick. Callies. It's funny, huh? We're sending our kids out to Alberta to dig that shit out of the ground just so they can put it on a train and send it all the way back to Nouveau-Brunswick. Only time that money train stop in Lake Madawaska? Not exactly how we want it to. Henry has now completed his train track with the track running across a projected map from the area of northern Alberta to New Brunswick. The track will remain on stage for the remainder of the play. Light rises on Henry. Me and the staff at the hotel, we get to know him pretty good because he's always making his regular run three times a week. Always stop here overnight, park the train up on top of the hill outside town, call a taxi, come to the hotel. We keep a regular room for him. Nice guy. Always smiling, always happy. At first, there were three of them, then before long, just two, then just him. Because first, the company is taking away the, how you call it, uh, the caboose, then the brake man. Then it's just him, the engineer, driving that big train all by himself. Even though those trains are getting longer and longer with more and more oil. Cutbacks, huh? Efficiencies. Henry, as a child, is playing with some model train cars on the track in the area of Manitoba on the map. But, nice guy, yeah? We got to know him pretty good. He's always telling us stories about when he was a kid growing up in southern Manitoba. I guess around there it's completely flat, huh? <laughs> Sound of a train is heard and builds gradually in volume. Me, I can't imagine that somewhere all flat, no trees, so you can see the trains coming and going forever. That's what he said. Said he used to watch them all day when he was a kid. 
Never ever wanted to be nothing but a trained man. I guess he got his last wish, huh? So we thought we'd change the format up a little bit this year, and we were going to ask if you guys had any questions about the play. So from that little little piece, comments, questions, I yeah, don't forget to buy the book. Maybe it would be better if you all bought the book first and then came back for questions. <laughs> so I don't know. If, yeah, if anybody has any thoughts, comments, questions you want to share, or I could just let you go buy the book. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Len. That was wonderful. That was lovely. Uh, okay, so uh, finally, this afternoon, we're going to hear from the independent aunties who will be talking about Gertrude and Alice. The aunties are Anna Chatterton, Evelyn Perry, and Karen Randoja. Anna is a librettist, playwright, and performer, a finalist for the 2017 Governor General's Literary Award for Drama for her play Within the Glass. Anna was named a top 10 Toronto theater artist of 2016 by Now Magazine and has been the recipient of the City of Hamilton Arts Award for Theater. Anna has been playwright in residence at Nightwood Theater, the National Theater School of Canada, Tarragon Theater, and Tapestry Opera. She lives in Hamilton. Evelyn is the artistic director of Buddies in Bad Times Theatre in Toronto. Her award-winning, innovative, and interdisciplinary work inspired by intersections of social justice, history, and autobiography. As a theatre performer, writer, director, and divisor, Evelyn is also a singer-songwriter. She's the winner of the K.M. Hunter Artist Award for Theatre, the Ken McDougall Award for Directing, and the Colleen Peterson Songwriting Award. And Karen is a multi-award-winning multi theatre artist who has directed and dramaturged devised performance for almost 30 years. She graduated from the National Theatre School of Canada Acting and went on to be a founding member of both Primus Theatre and the Independent Aunties. She has also been the director or dramaturg of such plays as This is the Point, Huff by Cliff Cardinal, Brotherhood, The Hip Hopera, My Nightmares Wear White, and numerous other performances. Her work has been seen in Australia, Denmark, India, Italy, France, England, Japan, and Mozambique. As a teacher director, she has been a faculty member at Humber College and the Center for Indigenous Theatre, and a guest instructor at the National Theatre School of Canada. So please welcome the independent aunties. Hello. 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 Hi. I'm Karen Randoja. This is Anna Chatterton. I'm Evelyn Perry. Um, uh, we have worked together for 15 years as the independent aunties, not aunties. <laughs> aunties. A U N T I A, yes. Um, our latest play took about five years to work and make come to fruition, uh, and that is Gertrude and Alice, based on Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas. Uh, it actually took four years because we had one year of maternity leave while Anna had a child. <laughs> uh, we worked at Buddies through the residency program, which we are forever grateful to. Our first attempts, we did so much research that we fell completely under the spell of Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas. So there was so much to tell about them that our first uh, iterations were much more like a biography. And then we realized it wasn't, you could, you could read that if you wanted to read a biography of, and, and there are many of them. So we decided to, we wanted to really explore how they, how they influenced, affected us and how we could meet them together on stage. They, uh, if you don't know, Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas were women, <laughs> artists. They were lesb a lesbian couple. They were lovers, uh, Jews, expats, exiles. And finally, when Gertrude's, Gertrude was at the ripe age of 59, they became celebrities and rich. Um, our play is also really concerned with uh, the question of what is a genius, since Gertrude Stein many, many times self-proclaimed herself as a genius. Um, and also uh, why uh, her name is no longer as well known as many other of her contemporaries who are also considered geniuses and who are studied and are in our lexicon uh, of artists nowadays, her less so, so we question that also. Uh, we faced a really big existing challenge because uh, we were both excited, inspired, and really daunted by her literary style. If you know her, uh, she's a 
product of modernism. Uh, she's very interested in repetition and the value of words and each word being as important as another and screw punctuation. <laughs> and uh, so it was really fun and challenging to try and write as her, but also as ourselves. So again, an intersection of us meeting together. Uh, it's been, uh, the, the play was recognized with various awards and nominations and it will be remounted this fall with a completely new design uh, in uh, 2018 at Buddy's um, and that will be officially announced next week. <laughs> <coughs> and you'll hear, can I have that? Uh, this is the beautiful book that Playwrights Sorry. Canada Press <laughs> has made, and uh, you'll hear a reference uh, in the play. They'll talk about, um, there are so many facts, we can't tell you all of them, so look in the back. Uh, each audience member, when they come to the play, gets this cahier. It's like a school book lessons of Gertrude Stein, and it tells their whole lives with pictures. Uh, so we often, throughout the play, reference, well, just look in your n notes. Do you want to move aside? <laughs> yes. So here, we're just going to, uh, we just made a small excerpt, uh, putting together a couple of different scenes. So the characters are Gertrude Stein. She has a mid-Atlantic accent, a large girth, and takes up plenty of space while radiating intensity and incredible charm. Alice B. Toklas, chain smokes, has a lisp and a visible mustache, a reserved physicality and severe yet energetic manner. The setting is a theater, the continuous present. The characters are aware of the audience at all times. To begin with, thank you very much for everything. And of course, everyone is very welcome. I declare, I do declare, it has always been a pleasure. It is a pleasure seeing you, seeing me, seeing you. <laughs> Who are you? Where, where are you? Why are you and when are you? It has always been a puzzle. Because right in front of us is the whole story. I am a woman and my name is Gertrude. Gertrude is my name. And why am I a woman and why is my name Gertrude? And when am I a woman and when is my name Gertrude? And where am I a woman and where is my name Gertrude? And which woman am I? Am I the woman Gertrude? Which woman named Gertrude? <laughs> All right, you know who I am. <laughs> think of the Bible and Homer. Think of Shakespeare. And think of me. <laughs> this is Gertrude Stein, the most important literary mind of the 20th century. And this is Alice B. Toklas. She is my secretary, and the one who makes life comfortable for me. <laughs> but to return to the occasion of being here with you tonight, and what a pleasure it is. I'm curious. It is such a pleasure to have you here, and I'm curious to know, I'm quite curious to know, how many of you here I've read all of my books, all of my printed and published words. I'm sure a great many of you have read me, but it would be such a pleasure to know just how many of you, just how many of you have read all of me. <laughs> a show of hands? <laughs> Is there a hand? <laughs> Is there one? Yes, no, no. No, well, anyway, uh, anyway, well, uh, I did indeed write a great many great books, and uh, so I will lower the bar, the bar that is all of me. All right, well, uh, well, anyway, well, I, uh, I want to know who here has read three of my books. One, two. Well, anyway, anyway, uh, well, anyway, this is the eventuality we had come to expect. <laughs> and although it is not, of course, the way we would like things to be, we have, of course, come prepared. As you may have discovered, there are extensive notes authored by myself and the inimitable Miss Toklas, 
which will give you the autobiographical and historical context you may be lacking, since you are clearly more or less, and by more or less I obviously mean less, familiar <laughs> with my work than would have been desired. And yet, and yet you are here, and that is very wonderful. It takes a lot of time to be a genius. You have to sit around so much doing nothing. Really, doing nothing. Good. <clears throat> Good. I'm doing nothing. Do you cook? <laughs> no leg of venison can compare with a leg of mutton prepared a week in advance. You must cover it with our wine, herb, and virgin olive oil marinade, you see? But the main point of the preparation is to arm yourself with a surgical syringe of a size to hold half a pint, you see? You must fill with cognac and fresh orange juice. You must inject the mutton in three different spots, three times a day for the week. Do you embroider? <laughs> How about a needlepoint? How extraordinary. What do you do with your hands then? I made sure to keep my hands busy every moment in order to provide an environment in which a genius could flourish. At our challenge, I sat with so many wives of geniuses. I sat with wives who were not wives, of geniuses who were geniuses. I've sat with real wives of geniuses who were not real geniuses. I have sat with wives of geniuses, of near geniuses, of would-be geniuses. In short, I have sat very often and very long with many wives and wives of many geniuses. I will always remember the day I arrived in Paris in 1907 because it was the day I met Gertrude Stein. It was to be a holiday away from the terrible earthquake in San Francisco, you see, but I never returned. On our very first night in Paris, my traveling companion, Harriet Levi, had been an intimate friend of Gertrude's sister-in-law, Sarah Stein. And Harriet said we should go see the Steins at the Saturday night salon. And we arrived, and Gertrude was there. She was a golden brown presence, burned by the Tuscan sun and with a golden glint in her warm brown hair. She was wearing a warm brown corduroy suit. Gray eyes hung with black lashes. Her eyelids droop. The corners of her red mouth and the lobes of her ears droop, weighted down with long oriental earrings. It was like anyone else's voice, unlike anyone else's voice, deep, full, velvety, like a great contralto, like two voices. She's a gypsy, her blues and browns and oyster whites, her heavy black Hebraic hair, her barbaric chains and jewels, her melancholy nose. I marvel at her beauty. I marvel at her perfection. I marvel at her charms. I marvel at her delicacy. <clears throat> Gertrude Stein, 
and a schmito. I asked her if she wanted to go for a walk the next day at the Palais Royal Gardens. No, baby, it was the Luxembourg Gardens. Oh, yes, that's right, boss, the Luxembourg Gardens. It was the most important walk of my life. I must say, I only three times in my life have I met a genius and a bell within me rang. And I was not mistaken. In no way was I mistaken. That was the beginning of 39 years together. 39 years and seven months. Yes, that's right, Bertie. 39 and seven, with never a day apart. Or even more than a few hours. Yes, lover, you are correct. <laughs> Buy the book. <laughs> And I think we have time for questions as well. I, uh, a note that I wanted to make um, earlier is, is that um, because both Stein and Toklas are in the public domain, we were able to play fast and free with their original text. So the book is about 50, we're not quite sure of the percentage, maybe 40% original writing from a wide variety of um, source material from primarily Gertrude, but also Alice, who was um, a writer herself as well. And so the book, uh, the, the, the play is a real um, meeting ground of their text with ours and our sort of assuming their voices as writers. And you can see in the book, everything that is um, italicized is their original work. So you get a sense of how the two meet each other in print. There's a question in the back. Well, I mean, for, for certainly her work, which has been sort of classified as difficult, <laughs> is it, it is a challenge. Her work is a real challenge. So perhaps not as accessible as some of her contemporaries, like Hemingway being a, a somebody that she mentored and is really associated with, who obviously has a kind of um, best-selling fame that Gertrude never achieved. Her most famous book, The Autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, written in the assumed voice of Alice in a metaphysical mindfuck <laughs> uh, kind of a thing. Was, it was a bestseller and um, it, it is actually, I recommend to people as a, a way in if you haven't read Stein before, like super accessible in its style. I mean, we, we're forced to conclude over and over again that it's inside of the sort of erasure of female voices and especially non-conforming female voices. Probably, I don't need to say more in a way, like th that, that, that seems evident inside of their lives and the sort of stature that they had as celebrities. They were very, very well known, but it's like what we've remembered about Stein is how famous she was rather than the work that she did. And that was one of the main reasons we wanted to write the play was that as we were researching and starting to begin the play, you know, people will say, what are you up to? And so we'd say writing play about Richard Stein, Alice B. Toklas. And the younger generation, younger than us, nobody had heard of her. A lot of, you know, older generation, our generation kind of heard of her. Most people hadn't read her. Maybe they had read one thing, didn't really understand it. So it just became this mission of ours for people to know who she was and love her the way we began to love her work, her and Alice. And to like ass assert her influence, because I think that's a big piece, like that she was such an, somebody who mentored people, not only, and she's also well known, and possibly the, w the way many people know her um, is as an art collector, which she was, and, and also propped up the emerging careers of people like Picasso as one of her more famous um, artists in her collection. Uh, but that influence that she exerted through the Saturday night salons, the gatherings of artists at their house, and the kind of literary experiment that she was up to in terms of language, like had a very profound, profound influence. And, and that was part of the connection for us through time was this sense of like excitement about her project and her breaking down of literary tradition. And I think we all connected more as theater artists who have spent our careers breaking with theatrical co um, convention and looking, you know, being excited by these ways, acknowledging foremothers and people who have gone before us 
getting deep inside of their, like her mind and her practice and what motivated her. I also think that when you read uh, some of the less hard to read texts, um, you kind of fall in love with her voice because she really understood what it was to live in the present, which I'm sort of slightly obsessed with, and how to live a good life, which is like a meal, a conversation, a cigar, look at a painting, sing a song together, go to bed. <laughs> um, and uh, so she's really an inspiring life guru in some ways. If you really begin to read through her, her uh, ideas about life, um, so I think that's really ins that really inspired me personally. She also only write, wrote for a half hour a day, and then Alice B. Toklas would type all her work. <laughs> <laughs> and they also lived off the trust fund. They did. This is a thing. Which was an <laughs> important... Which is a big question for an us. An important uh, realization, you know, partway through the, the beginning of the research was that thing of, like, how did they live this magical, charmed life? <laughs> like, what oh. was the secret? <laughs> and then, of course, that realization of the, the luxury that they had of not being upper class, but of being very well supported by their families to live as artists at that time in Paris. Moinen, you had a question? Um, design of all aspects. I all think design. I think we've always wanted the design to reflect uh, more artfulness, to match Gertrude's artfulness, and also to make it a little more less traditional uh, because she was so not traditional. And we ended up making a design that was pretty traditional on some levels. Uh, so now we have hired an artist who is Sherry Hay, who is mostly an, uh, an artist who lives in New York City. Um, and she's designing a whole landscape and structure. It's almost like being in a playground. And the look of it is based on the constellations, uh, constellation paintings that Picasso made uh, early on. So there are all these strange long tubes and little balls. And that will be um, in our play. Uh, and activated by sand. So each structure will move throughout the play because time is a really interesting uh, concept to Gertrude and the way she speaks about it. So we wanted time, something to happen with time and so you experience it viscerally. So the set will move, it will be much more abstract and yet much more in the world of Gertrude Stein, honestly, there and was in also the world of modernism. Th there was an impulse um, like to, it, with the chance to remount a work, um, it, it felt like an opportunity to continue to explore, and very much in the spirit of Gertrude's explorations in literature. Um, it feels very rare inside of our contemporary Canadian theater practice to get a second chance to approach a work and to do it as the original creation team. It seemed like a, an opportunity that was very exciting to get to reconceive what was essentially a first draft, the first production, you know, was a first, it was the first draft of the play, or uh, I mean, we'd it'd gone through many, many drafts, but the production draft was arrived at at the same time as the design under that three week rehearsal kind of structure that we so often work in. And um, so this was a chance to, to go back with a script that was finished and, and reimagine seven. where and how we might set the play, yeah. It's also gonna be an all-female team now. I mean, we had lovely men that we were working with, but we're excited <laughs> with this idea that we're actually doing a full female team, all the designers, all the creators, stage manager, everything. <laughs> and one of the iterations for a long time, we had a third character called The Maid, and she uh, at one point it became a musical, and I was writing the music, and the maid was singing about Gertrude and Alice, and she was sort of an outside eye about their lives. This was so like three now years we're ago. going to take a, take some of that music, and I'm going to try to compose something very like a soundscape through underneath the play. So it'll be quite different. Yeah. There was another question here at the front. Yes. Well, that was. I would say actually her plays were less of a source for us in terms of the work, like the, their biographies, for, certainly their relationship was the starting point of our interest in them as, uh, as creators. And, but, but wonderful you would bring up that point because it was the first sort of point of engagement with Sherry, the new director, was the idea of landscape, yeah, 
play as landscape. <laughs> that didn't really answer your question, but... <laughs> and circles. She's very into circles, so we're <laughs> going to be into circles, too. In our play. <laughs> And this, the idea of like the continuous present is the setting that we have chosen for the play and the idea inside of uh, the new design, design is one that where it shifts but doesn't actually change in a way or like, yeah, there's, there's a repet a, a, the potential for repetition inside of uh, the elements of set that we're going to play with this time. And we're also like, we played, we, we relied heavily on video inside of the production last time. And for me, I, I was really interested in the idea of what, what would happen if we stripped away video, which I think is, you know, can be such a wonderful tool inside of theater, but is so rarely wonderful in my opinion. Like, so <laughs> there are rare, I, I see a practitioner sitting in the front <laughs> row, Beth Cates, who's a total exception to that rule. Like when design, <laughs> when, when, um, when video artists get to be really involved in the making of, and when there is time and resource to make that uh, a theatrical element, not, not a wallpaper element. And it felt like we were, we were playing with video in a, in, a traditional way. In a very traditional way. And, and again, like it's been over and over with this play that we, we come to some conclusion, some draft, uh, a showing, and have to realize like to honor our subject, we can't approach this in a linear or traditional form. And we have to break again with that form to honor the spirit of what she's up to. I think we're at the end of time. I have to go teach a libretto workshop. <laughs> Thank you, Playwrights Canada Press. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and we are done for the day, uh, or well, for this, for this session. I, I know you all have other things to do at 2.30, uh, but we'll be here until 5 o'clock. And did I mention the discount, which everything is 30% off, and if you buy three or more, it's 50% off? Um, do come by the book booth. Uh, we have many copies of all sorts of wonderful things, and we'll be here through the end of Friday. Uh, thank you so much for coming out, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Just because there's a microphone and I can, I want to say thank you so much to Annie and Playwrights Canada Press for sponsoring the very delicious lunch and for this wonderful reading. Next sessions are at 2.30.